lot of questions coming in, so I don't know how we'll get through all of them. But uh, thanks very much, and um, it's delightful to be here. The um, picture that Tom has presented of uh, the global change that could happen is pretty scary, very costly, and the need to act is there. And Anthony has given us an idea of what a state government can do, um, but it is a, a transition. There's no doubt that we have to act quickly, but this transition is what um, I've been part of for 20 or 30 years. I know the um, climate emergency uh, saying we've got to start doing something. Well, we have started. There's a, an awful lot that's happened. Um, if we can see the first slide. The, um, the decoupling of GDP or GNI, this is GNI, gross national income, which is a bit better of a way to measure wealth, but it is decoupling. We now are learning how to grow our economies, create opportunities, pay for health and education, do all the things that economic activity is about. We are learning how to do that without fossil fuels. And that journey has been happening since the 1990s, but it's really accelerated this century. I'm in uh, all kinds of global, international groups now. The IPCC is the biggest one, but I've just come back from Hanoi today, uh, where we had a UN workshop of 25 Asian nations. Not Australia, but the Asian nations, the big ones that are, you know, China and India and all, the ones that, more than half the world, and they have big problems in transport. And this group is committed to environmentally sustainable transport, the EST. They started that process 10 years ago. They got together, the governments, and said, we've got to do something. They set targets and indicators, boring stuff that bureaucrats have to do, right, Anthea? And that kind of story you saw there with targets and indicators and pledges, they come about because people sit down and talk and write stuff and then take it to politicians and the pressure is on to try and do something. Well, yesterday I discovered that the ADB, who are the Asian Development Bank, they finance transport. In that 10-year period, the finance going to roads has gone from 91% in 2010 to this year 45%. And they, they were saying, now this is not due to us, it's due to the pressure coming from these countries to solve their problems, to create electric transport, public transport systems. And uh, I thought, well, you know, that's progress. That's 10 years with the big places that need to do something. They are getting on and doing it too. It's not just the Victorian government doing their little bit here. It is actually happening on a global stage. And you can start to see it, that it's actually manageable. It isn't totally out of control. We are beginning a transition that is manageable. Next one. Now, in Australia, we have also shown how to do this decoupling. The growth in our economy has happened whilst coal and oil have plateaued. In fact, coal has been going down now for nearly seven years. We still export a lot, but consumption is going down. So we are learning, we are working out how to do it. It's clearly not fast enough. But transitions are often like this. In the early stages, as you go, start going over the top, it's harder and then you go down the other side rapidly because you now know it's not so hard. In fact, it's better. Next one. Even a place like Bhutan, 
very poor country. It's very beautiful and it, you know, it's got lots of things going for it. But they are decoupling as well. In fact, they're already carbon neutral. Next one. And they have this gross national happiness index. They try to show that they can do gross national happiness increasing, gross domestic product increasing, and their greenhouse gas going down at the same time. That's our transition that we're all trying to do. Next. Now, there's a lot of theory about how you do this transition, and mostly it's about how you start in little niches down the bottom, and it slowly sort of coalesces. You get more and more local governments and industries working together until it's a whole landscape. But <clears throat> that process of change ca it can be accelerated, but it is a process that takes time. Next one. And over the last 200 years, we've had five other major transitions as we've shifted from wood into steam power based on coal and then the oil wave and now we're going through this wave of, of the uh, superhighway and, and, and the digital transition. And the sustainability transition is coming out of it. You can see that these waves are getting narrower, in other words they're happening quicker um, and <clears throat> they're all driven by different factors. But what I want to talk about tonight is, okay, we've got governments obviously have to play a role. They have to regulate, they have to set targets and do all that. And, and we're doing some of that. Industry have to play a role, but so do you. And what is your role? Because it's so critical to understand how important that role is. Next one. This is a new book that's come out it's called This Life, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom by a person who's not a um, religious person, but he's saying most of the major things that we gained, like the eight hours work, eight hours rest, eight hours recreation, uh, sleep, recreation, you know the story. That was a fight in the 19th century, during the middle of the Industrial Revolution. But the communities worked on that vision at that time. We take it all for granted now. But that became part of that transition. It was a vision set by communities, by civil society groups, by unions. And that was, he says, like a secular faith. And he also says... The fight to stop climate change is really a situation requiring a secular faith. So secular faith believers here tonight, good on you. This is what it's about. Next one. And there are lots of these visions that are happening. We've got zero carbon everything, circular economy, shared economy, biophilic urbanism, retro suburbia, regenerative cities. All of them are about hope for our cities and communities and settlements. Next one. So there are even new visions for mining. Now, I was on Virginia Trioli yesterday from Hanoi because she had discovered that we were now exporting lithium um, to the world. You didn't see me. I'm waving at you at the back. <laughs> Um, because she'd read this article in the finance, Financial Times, which was saying, we are producing the elements that are needed for batteries. Lithium, cobalt, manganese, vanadium, all of these elements. They come from Western Australia, my state, because we've got a very um, old rocks that are heavily exposed. It's easy to mine. And we've got now eight lithium mines. We produce most of the world's lithium. And they are being transformed into uh, value-added products for the first time. We're doing that. And that, that, that kind of vision, next one, is um, what we've called Lithium Valley. Because you can see on the left there is our, the Australian... Uh, uh, we, we, we lead the world in terms of resources in this area. This, 
the interesting thing for me, having spent a lot of time with mining companies, and they're not always doing the right thing, they are unbelievably committed to this vision of providing the world with an ethically uh, and transparently available product. It's going to have blockchain doping on everything so that you can trace it through and recycle it and so on. And, and they're very committed to this idea. So that's a secular faith. It is about not just doing something to make money, but it is actually creating a better world. And they want to be part of the solution. And it's such a relief to see them <laughs> enjoying that. Next one. So the main thing is we're going to win or lose this uh, in, the, in our cities. Next. You're supposed to look at me so I can wave at you. All right. This is the book which uh, I have here in my hand. It's called Resilient Cities, Overcoming Fossil Fuel Dependence. And I've got two copies here. I want to give them away to the best two questions tonight. Uh, one online and anyone else here who can ask a question. But um, it's, uh, it, it, it does summarise a lot of this that I'm talking about. And if you want to get one, I can, I've got a bit of paper here you can fill in and I'll send you one. So the... Uh, He's not looking at me again. Um, I'm going to quickly run through some of the vision that is uh, really a secular faith that is coming through in, in the work that we do. This is, this is Josh Burns' house. Josh set this house up. You, you know Josh, he's on Gardening Australia tomorrow night at 7.30. Um, he works full-time for me. He just does that in his part-time. But the... The house that he built was designed to show the world you can make something fossil fuel free and that it works for a family. And it does beautifully. Now just quickly run through these. So he's got the uh, induction cooker, he's got a um, heat pump, yeah. he's got an electric vehicle, he's got uh, batteries and PV on the roof. And next... It, the, the economics of it are, he's laughing after nine years and he's about halfway there now, but it's, it's, it's going to pay off and he'll be completely free then of the, of the cost of that doing that. Now that's really a symbol of what the world needs to do, isn't it? Uh, there's a bit of pain and then you can do it. He's also got to get work with a whole series of project home developers and shown them they can do it too. Next one. And he's shown that, that that will pay off after six years. Now, many of you have done this in your own home. And it is something that Australians are doing. We are getting on and fixing our own homes. Next one. Um, and we've also shown that you can do it with medium density developments. So it's, uh, it, this, this White Gum Valley project is... Is, um, is demonstrating 100 units of development that are completely carbon positive, exporting more renewables to the grid, and they are sharing it, next one, using blockchain. And blockchain is, is a new uh, way of, of uh, sharing you know, trusted information. This is a social housing project, and it's all part of it. So we know how to do it in our cities. There's no question about it. We've got to just mainstream it and keep the vision going. Next. There's beautiful additions to, to doing this as well, making the uh, open space work well. Um, and the next phase is going to do 1,000 units and after that another 10,000 units. Now, government is behind this but not driving it. It is, in fact, the private sector and they're showing that it sells... It is, in fact, easy. Next one. Um, now, transport uh, wasn't a lot in the, in the strategy on transport, I noticed. Um, and it is harder, but I'd have to say we've got to do it. We cannot just let oil continue to increase while we fix up coal. No, it's not. We've got to get on with that. 
And it's mostly about electrify, electrify, electrify. We can do it in all of forms of transport. It's going to be a bit harder on shipping and aviation. But, you know, we're going to have to continue to work on that. But in our cities, it's absolutely no reason why we can't do it. Let me just show you this. Come on, press it. <laughs> this is why I need the... So this is the kind of thing that's going to be happening. See, it's very, it's, it's smart, isn't it? It's smart. It's using that, that kind of smart technology. But it's not just saying, oh, we're going to have autonomous vehicles all over the city and they're just going to be running around looking for people. This is actually something that you can imagine will improve our cities. So we've got local governments all across Australia working with us now. and we've, The city of Wyndham want to put one of these in down at Point Cook, and uh, we'll be working with them tomorrow. Um, the city of Liverpool in Sydney have got a whole new vision for how they want to push uh, a, a trackless tram out to the new Western Sydney airport. So these visions are what drive change. Industry can do it, governments can back it, but without the vision, you don't get anywhere. Next one. Other visions are things like Density visions can be done in, like, Singapore's amazing biophilic urbanism. It's worth going just to see this. Next one. Um, we've got David Holmgren's amazing retro suburbia, which certainly fits in some parts of the city and, and needs... It's a better vision than the 1950s, as he's put there. Next one. Um, it's an extraordinary journal, this Renew. If you don't get Renew, it's, it's just beautiful the way it sets out ordinary Australians doing extraordinary things in their houses, their transport, their waste, and it's, uh, it's amazing visions. Secular faith, I call it. Next one. The Sharing Cities vision, which is a lot of this is happening in Melbourne. Uh, this is a book that was written from a Melbourne guy. Next one. And this Australian film, which is uh, done very well on regenerating cities. So there are positive things you can take, hopeful things you can take. Next one. And lighter footprints. What an organisation. I don't know anything quite like it. It's just amazing how it is creating this future for us. And that is the kind of thing that politicians, sitting down in the front row, and Others, industry people, businesses, they listen. They see what's happening and they say, let's get on and do this. Next one. Final thing. Secular faith. I actually go to a church and one of the things that I've learnt about, when you read the book of Revelation, it's, it's an amazing thing. There's this guy sitting on an island as Rome is collapsing, having visions about the future. And he sees two kinds of cities in the future. The first one, it's about frivolous consumption and it is doomed, it is going to collapse. And the next is a city of diamonds. What the heck is that? In theology and philosophy, diamonds are about the long-term legacy that people leave through their, their work. It is about what we do to create that future in our cities. So you build the city with your diamonds 
fitting together. They represent us. And the stories of hope are your diamonds that you build and create the future with. And it's so important that we, we keep doing that. Don't give up with despair and say it's, gonna, it's, it's all over. We can do it. These are my grandchildren and they will be around in 2050 when those kind of targets have to be completed. And this is the why I think we can do it this way, if you see the final one, which is that you can continue to create economic opportunity. The CO2 can disappear because renewables will keep growing. Coal will go first, then oil, then gas. There is no need for nuclear. We can do it. Thanks.